another live stream and chat. Today I'm going to be talking to the lovely, the wonderful Hazel Stone. And I'm so excited for you to meet her and to see her beautiful art and, and hear the great advice that she has for you about sketching people in wildlife. Um, I'm going to uh, just read you a little bio uh, for Hazel. Hazel Stone is a gifted uh, British artist currently working and calling in from her studio in South Africa. She paints in watercolor and oil and is the author of Learn to Paint People Quickly, this fabulous book, and about 15 other books. And she's held more than 20 solo exhibitions and she's had her own television series called Splash of Color on Anglia TV. She has traveled and painted her way all over the world. Welcome, Hazel. Let's bring her into this call. There she is. Welcome, Hazel. Hello. <laughs> so, um, Hazel, um, we're going to talk today about um, putting uh, people and wildlife in, in people's sketches. And uh, you're an expert in this area. My goodness, when I look at your art, it's just so fantastic. You're so great at it. Why do you think uh, well, it's important to put people in, in uh, our sketches? It is important, I think, because people are probably the most fascinating subject. And I think most people want to be able to paint people and to put them into the, their landscapes. I mean, obviously the landscape's fine without people, but it does bring life into landscape paintings. And it does bring color because you can add a splash of red in a jersey uh, into a, a, an otherwise green landscape. So it's really nice to feel confident that you can do so. And the reason I've included people and wildlife together is that both move. And I think that this is the big, that this is the real issue, is that because people and animals move, that's wherein the challenge is and where there's a bit of sort of daunting fear sometimes, which stops people doing it. So I'm hoping that by the end of this chat, uh, they'll feel utterly confident that they can have a go to use the watercolor brush quickly place their figures or animals into their paintings. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think it's, it's because people are moving and you're, it's hard to predict sometimes where they're going to go. And so I think people just kind of freeze and say, oh, never mind. I'll just put a, make it a blunt and empty landscape. Um, so um, maybe you could, should we look at your sketches and you can give us some advice about uh, how to do that? Yes, I think the best way is always an image speaks a thousand words. So if we can use the images uh, to, uh, I've chosen them for various reasons. So I'll try and sort of point out what it is that each one's been chosen for. Oh, yeah, there we are. Yeah, right. Now I put the tortoise on first because basically this is a nice slow moving animal. And that is what people and animals normally aren't. So that's really just a sort of intro uh, watercolour. Let's move straight on to the next picture because what I want to um, what I want to highlight is the beauty of watercolor over line is that you are painting area and so it's a very quick method of making your sketches. So if you look at the turquoise woman in the middle there, mm -hmm. she is actually line painted with watercolor. So the brush is painted line. Now look to the lady in red. And she is painted with watercolour, which is painted in patches. So in other words, instead of painting line, you're painting shape. And this is what the brush can do that the pencil can't do. And that's why it makes it faster. So what I'm trying to, I'm not saying don't use a pencil because you'll find later on there'll be um, sketches where you do need a pencil. But what I'm saying is that don't be afraid to go straight in with the brush. So the first things we're going to look at, oh, I just go straight in with the brush, no pencil drawing, to show you just how possible it is and just how quickly you can capture, if the, that's the word, uh, moving subjects. Right. So this is a typical page from one of my, this is a big sheet of paper. So it's a typical page when I'm out sitting um, somewhere painting figures. And usually I pick squares um, or piazzas or wherever in Europe and or promenades or wide spaces because what you need to do when you're painting people is you can't be too close to them. If you're too close, they're moving too fast uh, across your vision. Yeah. So you can't, you, you can't get them. So they need to be a distance away from you, especially if they're coming towards you because then they're on the same plane. So if they're coming towards you, so let's take the man there more or less in the middle with the turquoise shirt with the brown trousers. 
He's coming towards me, so I have a long time in which to see this figure shape. He's walking straight towards me. I, in this instance, I've chosen when the two legs are together rather than um, apart, because if they're coming towards you, there's not gonna be a huge gap between them. And usually you can very quickly indicate somebody walking by just one foot higher than the other, simple as that. Right. So the woman beside him, uh, to the right of him, now she's walking. Now, again, if she was close to you, somebody walking, it's very hard to uh, see really, even what's happening very quickly. So if they're far away from you, you've got lot, quite a lot of steps. And when someone walks, they're either usually doing the big V, which is that lady there where you've got the whole V right up to her skirt. Or if you go down below the man with the turquoise shirt on, you've got the half V where the, the bend is at the knee. So you've got Basically, in the walking figure, you're looking for two triangles. So it, the brush can so quickly make these shapes. Uh, it, I mean, it, quicker than the pencil. So what we're going to look at, basically, in the series of pictures is basically to give you confidence to, 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 to uh, sketch figures from life and not to be afraid of uh, all manner of, of shapes and forms. And I'm going to explain various ways to do it and basically how, how I do it. Yeah, so basically you're saying to forget about outlining it or whatever with pencil, just charge straight in with uh, the straight in. Basically, if you use it, like, if you've got to reserve light, and we'll look at that later, then you do need a pencil sometimes. But if something is darker than the background, you don't need a pencil, you just can take your brush and uh, you can, if, obviously the limitation is the water because you've got to have carry water. Now there are brushes like this, which have water in them. They're not usually beautiful sable brushes like I like using, but they're perfectly acceptable. And they've got water in them. I'm not going to squirt it everywhere, well, I suppose I can. Um, it's got a reservoir. So you can actually uh, use your uh, paint. I'm going to show you how few colors you need as well. Now this is my normal palette now, but when I first started painting, my palette was smaller than the size of a phone, a bit like this, um, palette here on the back of my phone, which is just a, a phone cover, but it was smaller than that with quarter pans. So I could take it absolutely anywhere in my pocket and I would carry my water in, uh, you know, that when we had photographs that were slides, uh, that were um, film, was uh, in those lovely containers that had a lovely oh, yeah. lid pocket in. Well, and they were waterproof and they were transparent. So they were perfect for carrying water around. So I would carry two or three of those in my pockets. I could always have clean water and I could go anywhere. And then I would just have a brush, a traveling brush, which uh, I haven't got one with me here, but they uh, probably people know about them. They have a, a lid over it to protect the hairs of the brush. So have brush, have a bit of water, have paint, and you can make any amount of painting. So it might seem daunting to start with, but it isn't actually because you just need to be able to have that facility of the water. And then the other thing to think about is where it, do you sit or stand? If you stand, you need somewhere to plonk that water or you've got to balance the water on your palette, which is something I sometimes do. I just balance the water on it while I paint. Oh, yeah. obviously, so that's very straightforward to do. Um, or, um, but that means you've got to have some place where your painting is held because you've got one hand with the brush one hand with the palette. So at some point, if you're standing, you've got to have something to balance one of these items on. Or you can sit down. I always carry, um, I don't usually carry a stool, but I always carry a plastic bag so I can sit anywhere, however wet or damp. And uh, what I uh, tend to do is I put three little pots into this little container here, which can go anywhere and never spill. And that way I can always have clean water in these, dirty water in there, which I just pour out. And I can plonk it down anywhere with a bit of uh, rag underneath so I can wipe my brush. So I'm completely and very quickly self-sufficient as a little painting machine. <laughs> wow, painting that's machine. fascinating. So, so uh, no tool, just necessary. No, I, I carry, usually I carry a bag. Um, if I'm not taking any photographs at all, then I carry a bag this size because that's just got my... Yeah, all, that's all I need for a, a big palette like that. And I don't need a big palette like that. I can carry just three tubes or even a teeny weeny palette. And then my water's in there, my sketch pad, if it's small, otherwise it's going to be a bigger sketch pad. Um, and then uh, my brushes and uh, my rag. Um, and basically, it's, you know, it's very little to have to carry around. Uh, and it's very easy to sit yourself down anywhere. So you're not encumbered. I, I'd hate to be encumbered by a stool. I like just to be able to plump myself out anywhere. And in my whole life, I have never yet not found somewhere to sit. 
Well, no, it is it. If it's not a stone, it'll be a log or a rock or a post or a, you know, in the, I mean, in, in the urban environment, there's always somewhere to stick, sit. It's actually yeah. you know, really easy. Yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Right. If you notice, um, most of these figures have got um, um, heads and limbs. Obviously, that's how a figures work, isn't it? So now I go on. And what I want to, uh, I just want you to look quickly at them so you can see that uh, sometimes they've got long trousers, sometimes they've got uh, shorts. So in other words, you've got to have some ready way in which whatever they're wearing, whatever apparel they have on, you can quickly uh, make it look realistic. So now let's go to the next image. Right, so each one of these, it, it gives you a, um, a sort of message uh, as how uh, I make these drawings. So here, the, the heads, first of all, if you look at the top left head, it's rather round. Heads are not really round, they're oval. So the first thing is a little blob for the head from the tip of the brush in an oval shape. And it doesn't, mat, doesn't have to connect with the shoulders. In fact, the gap between the head and the shoulders works like light on shoulders. So it doesn't have to, it can do, it doesn't matter if it does, doesn't matter if it doesn't. Then what I do is I, if, uh, if it's summer painting and people are, have got uh, arms and legs exposed to, uh, you know, without any clothes on, then I paint the limbs, the arms and the legs first, and then literally then in usually light red if they're caucasian light red a bit of violet sometimes burnt umber if it's dark skinned and then i add the clothes so i actually don't paint from the head down i paint head limbs because that gives me the action so each one of these you can see the uh, head is the head and the limbs have been painted first and if the clothes are darker than the limbs then i just paint the whole figure like a stick figure in the color of the flesh and then add the paint. Mm -hmm. so let's go on to the next one. I think uh, one thing that people are likely, um, uh, that this is scary for them, is the, get, having in their mind the, the idea that the, the person that they're putting in their sketch has to actually look like that person. Like they're obliged to make a really realistic um, representation of that person. That's an interesting question because when you're actually painting people from life, you can't even think about that because they all move so quickly that usually you might use more than one person to make one person. So you might, for example, be painting someone coming towards you along the street. He turns off, but luckily someone behind him is coming along. Totally different clothing. Nobody knows what he's wearing in your sketch. It doesn't matter what colours the clothes are. It's the movement you're trying to catch because the figure will feel alive if it feels like it like it's uh, like it could like it could be an action it's actually all about the, the weight um, on the ankle really the um if you want to get your poses right the nape of the neck the weight is taken from the nape of the neck so basically if you're working very quickly if you can make sure that if they are uh, taking the weight on one leg it's beneath the nape of the neck but the truth is you don't have time to even think about that when you're sketching from life because you're, you're trying to paint so fast and so hurriedly because you want to get something in before the person disappears. Right. That you don't think you worry about it looking like the person once you're painting. You might worry about it before you paint, but once you're painting, you're more worried that it looks like a person and that it's in proportion. Right. So more, I would say, worry more about having the head not too big. If the head's big, it will look like a child because he children's heads... Are bigger in proportion. Mm. If the head's too small, you can always increase it up. Right? So that's not a problem. Uh, so it's more the 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 aim should be the movement that they feel lively rather than static. Right. Yeah. Cool. All right. We'll move on to this next one. I think I think what you're saying is that um, people just you, you know you have to have a mantra in your head that says this is not a portrait. This is uh, just an amalgam, maybe of a lot of people you're just putting people in the sketch not a specific person i think if you think the word figure rather than people um figure because if you think the word figure it immediately takes it away from being a particular person oh and after, in your paintings uh it's going to be figures they don't have to be uh actual people uh, to bring life to a painting it, when you do want actual people 
you'd be surprised if you get practice at this, you can tell by someone's body language in the sketch. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, people will recognize, uh, you know, well, sometimes I do a whole load of sketches and the people around me will say, oh, that's so-and-so and that's so-and-so and that's, you know, they recognize because you get used to seeing body language. But I think the first thing is not to worry about that. That will just come, that comes by practice anyway. Yeah. Um, now, uh, uh, I was going to say, you said something then, and I thought that was very... Um, well, I just what you just said is think about putting figures in your sketch and not people, specific people, yes. which is really great advice. And I also think that's probably come for me a lot from painting in the bush and wild animals, because I learned very quickly that, for example, a, a springbok was painted not from one springbok in the end, but from several in the herd that if once I'd got the limbs at the front limb or even just one limb in or the head in, I had to then find another springbok making the same pose. And so ultimately, several springbok had been looked at, observed, to make the one that ended up on my paper. And in a way, people are herd animals in that same way. So you, uh, the thing that will attract you to a figure is often the colouring of the clothing uh, rather than the pose. So that you can retain in your head. And then once they've gone through, if somebody else passes by, they're going to walk in a similar way because we all walk in a similar way. Right. Uh, so ultimately, I think it's in the doing of it, you lose the fear of it completely, which is the same with most things, isn't it? Really? Well, that's, that's fantastic. So this, uh, so yeah. now this is it right now. So here is a close up of this business of doing the limbs and the head first. So. This is light red, I find a marvelous color for a Caucasian light skin, uh, light uh, skin color, because nearly always I'm painting with the light behind the figures or above the figures, because that means I haven't got to worry about light. We'll, we'll be looking at when things are lit, but it's much easier to paint something where the light is either behind or above, because then you haven't got to worry about leaving any light out of it. So therefore you can just go straight in with the whole shape. So here I will have painted the head and the neck, and the neck something one often forgets when you paint a head, because the neckline, especially if, you're, if people have got um, you know, sleeveless uh, outfits or shorts on, they're bound to have probably low, le no, low necklines as well. So when you put the, paint the head, bit of neckline, then the limbs are painted, and then the legs are painted right down from the waist, but I don't want that color to contaminate the turquoise. So immediately then, I, I usually use one brush, I, rather than, I, I just rinse it out. I don't usually use several brushes because it just takes too long. I usually just rinse the brush out and then dive into the turquoise and paint the uh, torso and let it meet the wet paint, the wet, light red paint so that they blend and the blending of the paint is what gives it the life if the color doesn't blend very well they tend to look static and the whole idea really is to try and do them i mean you have to do them fast anyway because they're people moving but if you can do it fast and not worry too much about perfection the watercolor will become so charming just in itself that that becomes the appearance of the watercolor becomes more important really than the likeness to a, a, a figure the likeness to a person mm -hmm. and i think um when it's a little bit blurry you don't have a sharp edge um you know between the edge of the the, the sleeves of the shirt and the arm and so on it, it works even better especially if these figures are in the background because you know you 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 don't want that really sharp detail anyway. The only time you want sharpness is in the light. So we, we will talk, and, and in this one, actually, you can see that he is lit from his left-hand side, which is the right-hand side of the picture. You can see the bit of light down the strip of his uh, shoulder here. I mean, well, you can leave, you know, uh, slithers of light anywhere, but we'll talk more about that when we go further on. Oh. If you just slip to the next one, there's two, uh, I think it's hockey figures. So these people are moving, these are moving fast. This was um, years ago when my son was playing hockey. Uh, really, really quick, but again, same principle, uh, using the light red to get the limbs in and then ultramarine blue, first pale and then darker. So very quick again to sketch and uh, very possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to do it really quickly. And you really see a lot of life, a lot of energy. Um, well, I think that's what the watercolour, whereas if you, if you were to draw them first, I think they would be more static. There's something about the watercolour brush that is so lively. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm just going to read you a comment, Hazel, um, from uh, somebody here who's, who's from Claire Putnam, who's saying, Hazel, I'm so happy to see you live because you're my favorite watercolorist. And I think I have all your books and adore your paintings and your loose, spontaneous style. Oh, thank you. <laughs> what, what are we looking at here, Hazel? So here's another page of done in a, a square, I think Venice, I think this time. Uh, and just to show putting people together. So obviously you don't have to paint people just on their own all the time. You can paint groups of people, pairs of people, people, figures holding hands, people pulling their dog or um, carrying a bag. So there is so much variety in people. And I think what happens sometimes if you go out to paint figures, is you get stuck into a rut of just uh, painting one figure after another because you're trying to get that perfect image that you think you're trying to get or you might be trying to get something lively and you keep on doing the same old pose but that's not the way to learn the way to learn is actually to take lots of different combinations and that way you start to lose your fear for uh, any of them if you look i mean if you look at the, the, you know there's, there's some here that don't work at all um, and some that do it doesn't matter it's just I'm just sketching people because of the love of sketching. There's no, you know, they're not going to end up as paintings anywhere. It's not going to end up, you know, it stays in a drawer. But I'm just painting for the love of it and learning all the time. And one or two might have that little frisson and often they end up in books. I think the figure, the guy with the uh, background of the Venetian red behind him, he did end up as a, 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 a something I pointed out in a book. So these things happen. <laughs> Um, so I don't want to jump ahead, so I don't know where you're going, but I just want to ask you about M and W. Are you going to talk about that? Yes. Now here, the two little figures uh, on the far right, midway down, who look like guys with waiters. That is a friend of mine called Ian King told me years ago that if you ever in, in, uh, don't know what to do, how to get a figure into a painting, then you just do a, a swift M. I'm going to draw it with my fingers like that. A swift M, a sort of broad M like that. So the arms and the V shape of this waiter sort of outfit are the top M. And then a thin W. So the W underneath is the legs. And you just let them meet in the middle. And that's what, and then you put a dot on the top. And that's what's created those characters, this M and W. I think I was, I think somebody came by and I was demonstrating how you can do a quick figure to them. I think that's why they're there in the corner. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's such a great uh, little trick that I, I read about in your book, <laughs> Learn to Save People Quickly. And I read that and I thought, that's so brilliant. So um, can you talk a little bit, uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead, I don't want to. Are you going to talk a bit about proportion, body proportion and shape? Yes, just on to, yes, we'll just look at, well, actually, we could do proportions here, but again, basically, the average person is about, their head is seven to one, but obviously, everybody's different, and um, the secret, really, is usually to elongate rather than make squatter, because if you elongate, you can actually fatten the whole image out with watercolour. It's still wet, so you can actually broaden it. If you make people too squat, you usually end up with, you can't really stretch the legs longer and you can't make the head at all. Yeah. So this is really, if in doubt, elongate is what I would say. Certainly make the head uh, oval and uh, the arms come down, basically they're just level with the thighs when they drop, when they drop down below, but you're usually moving. And so in any painting, in a way, you probably don't even have to worry about the arms, just don't make them too long, obviously. In a way, legs, can be any length because with watercolor you can very quickly wipe it off so if you did do them too long you can just grab a bit of rag and you can drag it off quickly or even i sometimes just take my finger and i just I'm not even licking it i just uh, push the paint and it becomes the shadow so in other words you move the paint aside yeah uh, so um it, but again it is it is by looking at the people i think the main pe thing people get wrong is they get the heads too big um and I would say if you use the brush, decide what size you're going to paint. This is a sheet of paper that I think is about 60 by 20. And I think the brush I was using was a size eight because when I press that down, just pressing onto the paper, that's the size of the heads. Yeah. And so that means you've got some kind of control over your scale. If you use too big a brush when you want to paint small, uh, it, it'll make it too difficult. If you use too small a brush, 
yeah. they'll end up tiny because you have to do too many brush strokes. And the whole point here is we're trying to make as minimum number of brush strokes to make these figures work. Okay, cool, cool. I have a couple of comments here. Uh, Barbara Gucci, hi Barbara, is asking, uh, when, when, Hazel, when do you put your figures in your paintings? At the beginning? of your paintings or at the end and she says oh, she's jumping ahead here we're coming to that we're coming oh, to okay. that <laughs> right. so barbara she's going to answer that question in a moment and i have another one uh from claire uh she says what amazes me is hazel ability to put two colors still damp on an image side by side uh, along them to blend allowing them to blend just enough without getting muddy well we're going to talk about that as well okay um, so I think I'll hold, if, uh, um, if you can wait patiently, we'll get to, I'm hoping I'm going to cover all the various things people might ask by the time we get to the end. So um, uh, we'll get there and, and keep the questions coming because then I know that it's, you know, that's what you need to know. Uh, this uh, little picture is in here, uh, this is in Tunisia, uh, because I want to show the grouping. Um, it's really fun once you get more confident in painting single figures to group figures together. And obviously, uh, in this instance, uh, the figure on the um, the figures on the left are one group, and actually the man was a separate figure. But in fact, it could still be they could still be the same um, set of figures. But basically, because the the woman on the left with the boy has been painted first, and then the darker figure behind her, and so in other words, they're painted. They're not painted all together. They're each painted individually. So it's the same the same process as before, uh, putting in one colour, and in this case, because they're wearing robes, actually they're just painted, the whole robe is just painted, um, and then the folds in the robe is actually what's been added into the wash in the figures on the left-hand side. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, then it, one doesn't ever try, I would never try, because you, you, I want to keep the paint wet, I would never try to paint uh, the lady on the left and then the, the lady with the headscarf, that, even... Uh, I wouldn't just do that. I would still just do one figure at a time. She's uh, obviously painted with the boy that she's holding the hand on. And then the next figures beside. And so in terms of a time frame, this each figure's probably taken a few seconds to paint, but there's probably 15 minutes have passed before those four figures are in. And they're all long gone and disappeared. And there was never a moment when that was a real situation. Right. I, you know what, I love this, um, this shadowy person in the middle, um, the folds of the, of the robe, it's just gorgeous, and you know, it's just, there's like, there's no details, there's no face, there's no hands or anything, but it, you know exactly what it is, it's just so, so lovely, so well done. That, I, what I think the beauty of watercolor is, is that it's this mantra, less is more. Yeah you can do so little with watercolor and say so much and mm -hmm. I, I still find it miraculous I still it still leaves me in wonder now I mean yeah. to this day <sighs> yeah well your enthusiasm is, is infectious um I just have a question about uh hands and feet so um this woman in the middle who's walking towards us with the white scarf um so you haven't worried about um, her feet or her shoes or anything like that and it doesn't matter does it? No and absolutely if they're coming towards you forget about feet. A, a shadow is a really useful thing so if they if the sun is shining a shadow anchors them very nicely to the ground mm -hmm. and if they're coming towards you you really mustn't think about feet because you actually make them look um, rather plonky really. Yeah. I mean they, right. they tend to be a toy town. If they are going sideways uh, let's just go back, there were some sideways people in the one before. I usually don't worry too much about feet if they're far away. Um, uh, there will be some where the feet do, let me just go to the side, which one, the one we went, never mind, uh, yes, here we are. Uh, yeah, no, I don't think I've worried about feet. Uh, I think the only one when there's a bit of a foot is that woman running with a bag on the bottom left. There's a bit of a bent foot because that's sort of, she was taking her weight on it. But otherwise, even the sideways ones, I haven't really worried. I don't tend to worry about feet, but there will be one or two later that we'll see where I do. So there's a there's a monk coming up where his feet matter. So uh, we'll. <laughs> but absolutely, you're absolutely right. And hands, uh, I do lift the brush off just at the end of the hand so that you get a slight blob, but it's teeny weeny, which can be seen as 
a bit of a hand, but I don't think about it. Um, it's not you know, I just, but I do, I am aware of it. Um, I mean, that woman uh, pulling her push cart, it looks like a bit like a golf club she's pulling. Uh, you can see this just where the hand's been pushed off, uh, uh, where the uh, end of the hand is, the brush has just been lifted off. It just leaves a little bit more because there was a little bit of pressure before it lifted. And so it deposits a bit more paint. Yeah. But kind of things, you don't have to think about those things. You'll find you just do them, you know, if you think about it, it'll all become too contrived. It's right. got to be terribly natural. And um, the woman down the bottom right, you can see her hand just at the end of her blouse. Uh, it's just a blob. And the more blobby, the less you try and make it look like a hand or a foot, the more it will look like a hand or a foot. That's the bizarre thing about watercolor. Oh. I have a question here from Romana Davies, and she's asking, uh, which light red do you use for the skin color? Um, well, I think some of these are, now I use mostly Schmincke colors. So I use, um, uh, their, their light red is called Pot Soily Earth. Um, but uh, basically light red is the opaque version of Burnt Sienna. So it doesn't matter what brand you're using, you want the opaque version of the burnt sienna. So Venetian red, Indian red are all a bit dark, but you could still use them. A uh, lot of the, uh, this sketch, I think the light red was Windsor and Newton, uh, but it might be Pozzuoli Earth. Um, difficult to remember, but I, I've gone, I've tended now to use all schmink bar one or two colors because I just, I find them the most wonderful brand. Yeah. Um, and uh, here in that, in that one, the one before the, the uh, Tunisian one, I don't think I used light red. Now here, uh, again, it, with African figures, I don't use light red because it's too pale. So here is um, burnt sienna and ultramarine blue together or burnt sienna and violet together. I think in these actually it isn't violet, it's burnt sienna and ultramarine blue. But now the reason I put this little group in, again, each one of these has been painted individually. The group in the middle did hold together. They, the group in the middle were standing around. So they actually are, you know, real actual group of people hanging around together. But the two on the sides, never at any one time were these five people in association with each other, but they are in my painting. And the reason I include this one is because of the beauty of light. Now, if you look at the women in the middle and you look at the arms, you'll see little slithers of light on the top of their arms. And that white light is so useful because it means you can divide your painting colours. So the one on the left, she's red at the top, yellow sarong underneath. Uh, the one on the right, it's more to give us the uh, feeling of her hands being behind her. Back, uh, back of her. Uh, doesn't really matter in terms of colour because she's wearing the same costume. But it gives you a breathing space for your colours. And so, whereas I love to colours to blend together because that gives the movement and also watercolour, colour in shadow, you tend to want it to blend, blend together. As, as soon as colour, uh, as soon as um, figures are lit, there are going to be these lozenges of light. And we're going to talk about them more again later. So, um, uh, that's really, I just wanted to introduce us at the beginning with these uh, little groups of figures which weren't really in settings. So now we'll just talk about the animals, which really and truly the subject matter, you know, animals and people are the same for a watercolours concerns because watercolours are flat, they're just patches of colour on pieces of paper. So in terms of watercolour, it knows no difference between a human and an animal or a landscape or a rock or anything. Um, so the same process here, you just see a page from a, a sketch, but you can see on the left, I've just been looking at the shapes. So just using one color of the watercolor. And then when I feel I've got an idea what the shapes are like, and wildebeest are the oddest shapes on the planet, I can tell you. <laughs> uh, then I get braver and then I use a pale undershape. So in this case, yellow ochre. And then I drop in ultramarine or burnt sienna to start to, to model them. So it's the same kind of thing as with people, but it's the whole shape this time uh, and all the legs, because I find it, if I don't get the whole shape in right at the beginning, I find it quite difficult to remember, you know, what was the shape basically. So I use a light color to start with, get the shape and then while it's still wet, drop in the deeper colors. And again, you can do it very quickly, but it takes, again, you know, it takes lots of painting to right. get confident. Yeah, yeah. I think you know you, you're so talented. <laughs> you you know you accomplish the people, and then you said, okay, what weird shaped 
animal can I go with next? So that you, you gave a little challenge to yourself. It's not so much like that. I, I, I basically it was actually the African bush that taught me to paint watercolor. Uh, quickly because I was painting in the bush it was very hot so it was drying fast so I had to find a technique that could work in the bush uh, to my satisfaction um, but the beauty of it drying fast did mean I could paint a lot uh, yeah. and cover it with paper um, and I've never seen anything as any different subject matter to me the subject matter is light uh, or, or, or it's the shape so I don't see figures or animals as any different shape and well uh, wildebeest are an odd shape compared to lots of other animals um in a way the the challenge is the same because anything that's new to you uh, is going to be an odd shape so the first time you paint an elephant it's odd once you've painted hundreds of elephants like i have now i don't see it odd anymore because i'm familiar yeah. with it right. once you paint a, when you first paint your first figures they're going to be odd if you haven't been used to painting without drawing first because you're going to feel out of your comfort zone but as soon as you do it I mean, it really doesn't take actually you know, any one session. People, when I've, when I've taught people, they've been amazed at what they've achieved within their, sort of their first figures, a little bit, a little bit watery and a little bit nebulous and usually got a big head and usually got big feet at the bottom. And then about three figures in. And, a big know, improvement. Oh, ma I mean, like massive improvement to the point, you know, where they, they suddenly think, oh my goodness, I can do it. Oh, oh, how, do, how come it took her so many years? You, know? <laughs> you just have to put in your 10,000 hours, I guess, and, and get some tips from a professor. But, yeah, but I think the thing with watercolour is because watercolour is such a beautiful medium, it will, it will reward you quicker than any other in terms of these quick sketches. It's a different matter when you're putting it into settings because once composition gets involved, that requires a lot more skill. But for quick sketches, if you get confident in the medium and don't try and control it too much, and don't try and tell it off and don't try and push it around too much, it yeah. will reward you. It is a very, very, it, it's not the unforgiving medium people think if you don't yeah. overwork it. It's a very wow. kind medium. Cool. Here. Now here, what, I've included these penguins partly because they're here in Cape Town near me, but because you can really see the brush stroke here, you can see that this brush will have painted this this piece of paper is about um 16 by 12 something like that so the size of each of these uh, flippers is about well i can tell you the size it's exactly the same size as the head of this brush because literally i have made the flippers with one brush stroke with that brush loaded in this case with uh indigo uh indigo and sepia indigo and sepia i think mixed together um so if I want to paint on a bigger sheet of paper, then I just need a bigger brush so that I can make a bigger flipper. And if I want to paint smaller, then it's got to be a smaller brush because obviously I want to be able to do the stroke with one stroke. The whole thing is a sort of, I almost think it's like time of motions. You know, it's got to be efficient if it's going to be quick. So you don't want to be having to do two strokes to make one flipper. And then same with the back, um, back of the penguin and the penguin are just like people really and here we do need feet on these little penguins as you can see yeah <laughs> uh, the, the 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 sort of joined up stroke that makes the back so if you look say uh, the second one in from the top the beak is the tip of the brush uh, pointed and then tip of the brush again comes down from the top of his head the brush uh, is pushed down onto the paper to make the brush stroke thicker for the body and then goes thin again to be the, in fact like probably reloaded to do the two uh, the two uh, flippers at the side yeah somebody has right. asked uh, a question here which i think is um uh we're, we're we're sort of talking around that she this person this is a phoebe wilson is saying uh, how big do you typically paint uh people and and maybe the figures of animals as well so she says, um, you talked about the size of the paper and the brush, but not the size of the people in terms of inches or millimeters or, you know, how, like how, uh, you know, you're just putting figures, figures in the background. So. Well, basically it will depend. I mean, when we come to where I'm showing them in settings, which we're coming to shortly, uh, then you'll see it's different proportions for the different landscape settings. So if your piece of, you know, if your, if your landscape is that size, and you want tiny figures then there might be only you know might only be that tall but if you yeah. want the figures to be bigger now i would say these are all what i would call um 
figures rather than specific people. So they're never going to be huge because if they were too big, they'd have to then have a bit more specificity about them uh, or be treated differently. But right at the end, I'm going to, I am going to show you uh, using the method uh, big um, because I just love this whole sort of image of the quick sketch. But the size, size really is down to the brush. Whatever size brush I'm using is what ends up being a figure. And also uh, to do with how far away they are, because one tends to work sight size. If you're not trying to make a painting, if these are just sketches, we're not trying to make a painting at this stage, we're going into that as we, as we move on. Yeah. Um, uh, you, one tends to work sight size. So uh, a lot of it's to do with the brush, but a lot of it's just to do with, you know, how far away they are when you paint. And, and also the size of the paper you're working on, the size of your sketchbook. Right. Here's another page from a sketchbook. I mean, these are just to, to show pages from the sketchbook. We can flick through these. But again, here, uh, these, this sketchbook, I think, is a 16 by 12, again, I'd say. So those birds are, um, well, it depends what size your screen is, doesn't it, I suppose, as to what you see them as. But the birds themselves uh, must be about four inches high, I suppose. This saddle build stalk in the, in the foreground is probably about uh, four inches high. Um, on that kind of piece of paper. But it's just really to show that I have, I mean, I have so many sketchbooks and they're filled with pages and pages of this kind of thing, which may never see the light of day again, but they are, as you say, the 10,000 hours. They're me just practicing with the paintbrush and the thrill is in doing it. It doesn't really matter if nobody ever sees these. For me, I just love making the, it's a way of observing life, it's a way of uh, seeing the world uh, and then sometimes one can get a little bit more complicated by putting a bit more challenged I say rather than complicated by putting uh, characters together so a bit like with the groups of people when you start putting animals together then you're starting to make a painting as soon as you're starting to make a story about it that begins the narrative of a painting right so I think that's the end of the sketches now I want to talk about the um, the process of, of the wet in wet paint um, and then we'll come on to putting them into settings. Okay. Do I need to go ahead to the next sketch? Please, yes, please, yes. Next sketch. Now, the next sketch should be a monk. Yay. Yes, it is. Right. So, uh, this has a, a nice, you can see the, the texture of the paper, hopefully, here. So, you can see this actual, in uh, this, the sketch is about, um, he would be about three inches high. So um, he's part of a whole set of monks, but I decided I just wanted to show you one. Now here we can see the feet because he's sideways on and he's wearing a habit. His feet matter. If you imagine, if I hadn't put feet in, it wouldn't work would it? because one, if you just had uh, little spikes at the bottom, it wouldn't work. So the feet are important. So what happens is when you're painting figures, you very quickly learn what it is you need because if you don't do it, you notice it in your sketch immediately that it didn't work. And the beauty with the whole page of figures is that it doesn't matter if some work and some don't. As long as you, if you've just got one or two that work, they carry the whole lot. So it doesn't matter if you've got bad pictures, you don't have to go correcting them or anything. Uh, it just, you know, it, it's, it's lovely watching someone's observation on paper. Mm -hmm. But the reason this one's here, not just so much for his feet, is to show how easy that sash, uh, what do they call it, not a sash, a cord. Yeah. What do they call that? Uh, yeah, uh, round, how easy it is, but just by leaving a gap and then a little slash across the bottom bit. We know exactly what that means, don't we? We know yeah. it's this. And it's so, you need so little to say so much that, you know, we, we know a lot about that monk. And yet it took seconds, not even hardly seconds to paint that. The, this case, because there's hardly any limbs, I did not paint that hand and face first, that head first, I painted the body. Because in this instance, what I need quickly is the whole shape. I know where to find the head afterwards. If, I, if he's gone, it doesn't matter. I can guess where the head is and I can guess where the hand is. Right, right. So just to recap for a moment, somebody has asked me about um, the, um, the, that red paint that you mentioned. Pot, did you say Potswellian? I've never heard of that. And, and they, yes, they need that. Potswellia, P-O-Z-Z-U-E-L-I, Earth. U-E-L-I, Potswellia, I've never heard of that. And that is... Uh, um, I, I think Schmink are a German company, and so they sometimes use different names, but um, they also had a burnt sienna, which was opaque, so that was quite useful, and then now they make a transparent one as well. Mm -hmm. um, 
But I mean, obviously every, I don't know what, Dan, Daniel Smith you use a lot of, don't you, in America? And they will have an opaque burnt sienna. Now I don't know what it's called. I can certainly find out and let you know. Okay. Um, so, so, and also yeah. you're painting these with a, a, around a number eight or 10 round brush? Uh, these are eight or ten. Yes, I mean, I, th I suspect if it's if it's this will be a ten. I think this will be a ten. This one. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And uh, now here's a whole group of figures coming towards me. Um, and the reason I show this uh, little drawing is because they've all been painted with a dark colour. I mean, obviously uh, one or two have got light heads on for a bit of variety. But the one on the left, the dark one on the left, the woman. They've all basically been painted with that colour and then I have dropped into it the colours of the clothing. So the guys with the sort of burgundy jerseys on, they, underneath, they're all the colour of the lady on the left and then the burgundy colour has been dropped in while it's still wet. And the same with the, the second lady in, her head and her hand have been dropped in. And this is one of the reasons why I use the light red because it's opaque and opaque colors in watercolor can drop into darker colors and lighten them. Okay. Yeah. Now, so That's that a is a tip. That, I've never heard that before. Mm. Opaque it, colors in watercolor can drop into a darker color and lighten it. Yes. Oh, exactly. That's a good tip. And the same, it, it's the same in oils. Opaque colors bring light, cadmium red and cadmium yellow. You work on a dark ground you, and you bring light in with the opaque colors. Um, but in watercolor, it's all much more obvious because mostly you're going from light to dark. So you're often adding transparent colors, one on top of the other, which darkens them. But if you then need to reintroduce light, you either need to drop water in, which is what I've done on the right hand side to make gaps between the people or those little, little group of figures with bits of uh, the, the paler color is just pure water dropped in. And also the guy um, three in from the left, the fourth one in the background, I think that was probably an accident. I don't think I intended to do that, but it doesn't matter because he just ends up with paler clothing. Um, oh. But I, so I, I can use plain water, which just pushes the color aside and makes it lighter, or I introduce uh, the opaque color. And I, that's really, I think, why I went to the light red in the first place was because it was opaque and therefore I could drop it into the colors. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, Hey, well, what I think we're, there's sort of two different things that happen with watercolor. One is the technical skill, but the other is um, forgiving yourself for your own mistakes. And um, I, it's the mental game, you know, because I hear from my own students often, they'll say, oh, you know, this, this sketch that I did is terrible. It's no good. It's awful. I don't even want to show it to anybody and they're embarrassed and so on. Um, and so what would you say to people, you know, about just overcoming, um, you know, the, the, this fear of failure and the, their expectations for how something I, should turn out? Yeah, it's a very important point, this, because I think the problem is that you make a product with watercolor, therefore you can see the ones that don't work. But if you were a golfer and you were hitting thousands and thousands of balls to get better at golf, you're not going to expect every single one to go to the right place. And you're not going to mind, you're going, you know, if you've got 50% in the right place when you're standing on the tee, you know, not, not when you're playing the golf game, obviously, because that's when it matters. But when you're practicing, you're not going to mind that someone just, well, you are going to mind because you're trying to get them straight, but you're not going to, uh, there's no, no record of it anywhere, is there? So yeah. the same with painting is that you should be prepared to cover paper. That is really the, the it's a shame that watercolor paper is so expensive because it's actually in covering paper with paint that you learn to paint watercolor. You cannot, and although I want to sell lots of books and lots of DVDs, you cannot learn to paint by reading lots of books and DVDs. You have to actually paint. Yeah. You can learn from these books, but you must go out and you have to cover paper. Yeah. And as you cover paper, you will, by default, make lots of things that you might term failures, but one, they're lessons, they're not failures, they're lessons. You know, when we were kids, we didn't think what we were for, that, oh, we can't do calculus, we're a failure. We were learning as we went along. And every, the, the, the trouble with um, leisure painting, I think, is that, and I'm as guilty of it as anything, is that one tries to say, you know, do this, it's easy. And we make it look easy because we've been doing it for years or whatever. Uh, and there is an element of easing what we're teaching because we're trying to say, look, go for it, go for it. 
sometimes it will work because that's the beauty of watercolor sometimes it won't work um but it doesn't matter when it doesn't work it, you know I, I have probably i have oh i don't know how many drawers full and cupboards full of supposedly failed watercolors but they're what made me uh, who i am yeah. you, know, I, you just have to it's part of it you don't you just have to do the next one i mean i, I think that we, Lots of people say the reason painters keep painting is because they're always disappointed with their last painting, and that's very true. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Um, I think I have a comment here, a question. Um, um, Eileen Goldenberg is saying, people need to realize that there are no mistakes in art. So there you go. All right. And so what are we looking at here? All right, here, now, here, if you look very closely, there is pencil line. So I'm not saying that you don't ever, you don't, you know, abandon the pencil because the pencil is obviously a very useful tool and we'll see later when things are lit an even, even more useful tool. But when you do do a pencil drawing, if you can just see the pencil line in this, you can just see the pencil line around the umbrella and I think down the side of her skirt, don't fill in your pencil lines. So if you're going to do watercolors, if you're going to do a pencil sketch before, and I've, you know, if it gives you confidence uh, especially if you've got lots of people walking around and you feel like you can't go straight into the paint to start with. So you do some quick little pencil things and then you feel brave enough to paint on top. Don't fill in your pencil lines. Re use them as a guide to the proportion, but not to the shape. Let the brush stroke make the shape. Because if I had followed the pencil lines, one, I would have an edge, a pencil edge, which is yeah. an edge. It's harsh. Yeah. Um, that's why I included that one just to show you that you know sometimes I use a, a quick pencil sometimes I'm not even thinking I'm going to paint and I see something I want to paint and I haven't had a chance to get my pencil my paints out so I might just do a quick sketch with pencil um, and then come back and paint but I will never just fill in the pencil lines because it'd just be dead as a dodo yeah cool that's a, a good tip now I want to talk more about this wet in wet. Now this is quite a big picture. So these were done, I think, with a size 12 brush. So these figures are, um, they were walking in a New York street and they're about uh, eight inches high on the paper, the, the figures themselves. And so here, the one on the left, there were two girls together. So I needed to have them, I wanted this association with them and they were walking away. So I had to be very quick. So I'd use large brush because I've got to do it fast. I was already painting, my watercolour paints were already wet. I couldn't really have done this if I was starting dry because I couldn't have done it quick enough. But I was already sketching other things. And then I saw these two girls and they just had that kind of look of being, you know, that retail therapy look of being together. And I just thought, oh, I love that. Uh, so my, it's important to know the paint's already wet because you, it does take a while to get your paints going. So you couldn't do this immediately sitting down that size because your paint wouldn't be ready. Right. Uh, so the girl, on the, basically alizarin crimson is the uh, main colour, so the girl on the left is being done completely in alizarin crimson, the whole of her, then the girl on the right the same, but then colour is now dropped into the alizarin crimson and dark, deep, um, deeper, more neat colour. So if you look to the girl on the left, you can see that the alizarin crimson that darkens her is actually quite neat. So I've used quite wet color to make sure it stays wet because we're talking big, big brush to make sure it stays wet. And then uh, when I've gone to the girl, the, the girl beside her, I've changed that color into a violet by adding blue into it, but it was very wet. You can just see the alizarin peeking out. Uh, not, the bag is added so that you, that's not the alizarin crimson, but if you can see the color under and then black's gone down her leg. And I don't, it looks to me like I didn't finish her legs. I think I only got as far as her coat. Um, in the alizarin crimson because I can't see the alizarin crimson in the legs but um, basically the whole shape had to be done and I left the space for the neck you know this furry sort of um, collar that she's got on I just left a space because I knew I couldn't uh, get that in quick enough uh, before they'd gone yeah. so um, you know you've got sometimes you've got to be ready if you're going to try and be bolder and bigger right cool beautiful lovely and this, this next one is one of my favorite little sketches actually, because never be afraid of the splodges of watercolor. One of the beauties of watercolor is the little backgrounds, the bits of water that, that background in, you know, the, the cauliflowers people sometimes call them, because they are the charm. You know, to me, 
this watercolour is made by the bleed of the watercolour and the blur of the watercolour. Uh, that to me is the charm of it. I love the fact that the guy's head sort of splurging out into the background and the big splodge at the side. That's the beauty of the watercolour. Yeah. So um, uh, somebody is asking, Hazel, do you spray your paper? So this is the Suzanne is asking, do you spray your paper before? Uh, no, the water, the, the paper's dry. Okay. Paper's dry. But do, okay, so do you use the typical uh, trick of spraying, the little spritzing your, your palette? Oh no, I never spray my palette. No, watercolour is, is so perfectly balanced with it. If you, if, you, if you spray it when you're not using it, you will leach out all that gum arabic. No, you should, oh no, you should never, ever spray your palette. No. Really? You only ever wet the watercolour that you're using. Yes. Oh, oh you waste, you, you, you'll end up with dead pigment in the bottom of pans, which is useless to you because you will have leached out the gum arabic. Okay, you know what? I, I've seen a lot of a lot a lot of um, urban sketchers, and they take the little spray bottles with them, and they spritz their uh, whole palette to kind of make the watercolor juicy. You would never do that. No, no. But then don't forget, I'm not using all those colors. Yes. Anyway, but uh, you know, at any one time, I'm usually probably only using three colours, so I wouldn't want any of the other colours to be wet until I need them, because I want to be able to close that palette up and it not run in any way. Right. Uh, I only want to bring water in, which is going to leach out and dissolve the gum arabic when I need to. Otherwise, you will waste an awful lot of paint. I can tell you. Okay. Well, that you know what? It, I love interviewing so many different people and learning their tips are all so different. And when I hear a tip that's completely different I've never heard before, it's like, ah, oh, so exciting. <laughs> well, that's cool, interesting. Shall we move on to the next clip? Okay. And I have another question for you uh, from Claire. It's asking, would Hazel recommend her favorite warm and color primaries that you like best? Well, funny you should say that now because uh, we are now going to be starting to, well, in this one, but later on uh, with Little Elephants, talk about um, the colours. Because here, this elephant is made with red, yellow and blue. And uh, this uh, was just meant to be a quick um, one on from doing the, the wet in wet uh, before we talk about silhouettes. But actually now um, we can uh, talk about it now because... I, again, like I was doing with the wildebeest, I paint the pale colour first, usually, usually a yellow, then I drop in my red, then I drop in my blue. And that means that also the paint, the, uh, the water, hasn't got dirty too quickly. So my water is only dirty with the yellow, then dirty with the red, then dirty with the blue. So if I'm only, if I'm doing something very small, not used to use too much water, um, I, I got enough water that's clean. So, uh, the primaries will be different every time. Uh, in this case, it will be, this would have been yellow ochre, alizarin crimson and Prussian blue. But for, uh, later on, we're just gonna look at three different other color, uh, color combinations of elephants. Because basically red, yellow and blue make gray, make brown. Uh, so it can be any combination and there's so many to choose from. Right. So now you've come to the next one. So we're going to come to settings because this is what we've got about figures in settings. So if, the light is behind your figures and their silhouettes. It's a very straightforward thing. Your setting is painted here. You know, this is a, a probably a painting that's uh, probably about that size and washing the color in for the background here in Africa dries very fast. And then the silhouettes just painted on top. So the whole thing is probably an eight minute painting. Right. Um, just long to do at all and the, the children are playing in the in the water and they're not going to disappear for a while there's plenty of children around so the background needs to dry before the figures are painted on but they're literally just one color figures and here it's the grouping that matters so the two on the left they actually I remember painting this distinctly and they stayed more or less in that position for a lot of the time because they were busy doing something in the water the boy on the right, he was the one who moved, and so he was added in after. So the two figures were sort of painted together, first of all, and then the boy positioned so that the composition was nice. So once, you have a comp once you're trying to paint a whole painting, composition comes in, and that's when you've got to think a little bit more. So that's why you need to have painted dozens and dozens of figures just on sheet to paper, so you're confident with your shapes. Likewise, this one again here, including a dog. Now look at these shapes, look really closely. They're just hieroglyphics. They're not, you know, they're, they're, they're really odd brush marks, aren't they? If you look at them, I picked this one because I just love the fact that 
the dog, what is that shape? But you know it's a dog and you know he's carrying a stick. What is, you know, the, the, men, the men running, I mean, they're really blobby and odd. This is the beauty of the brushstroke. You know, they're, they're, they're almost, you know, Chinese hieroglyphics characters, right, aren't they? Right. Yeah. Yet they work. They and work. the three together work. Yeah. And you, you couldn't, you know, you, you have to not, you have to not try and be too perfect is almost what I'm saying. Because yeah. you must let the brush, let the brush dance on the paper. And, and it is the brush and the paint that's doing the work. You're doing it, you're facilitating it, but you're trusting it. Yeah. You're trust it can do better than you can do. Because if I tried to make that look like a dog, and yeah. make it look like running people, yeah. I can promise it wouldn't look as good as it looks. Yeah. You know, from looking at your, your book, which I, I'll, I'll, I will blatantly advertise right now, Learn to Paint Quickly, um, what I noticed in this book is uh, that there are a lot of silhouettes, a lot of people who are silhouettes, and, back, and because they're backlit. And I realized, you know, um, the beauty of uh, adding figures to your sketch is that it just, uh, rather than having just a flat landscape that's static, you brought some life and some energy into the sketch. But uh, what I, I learned from your book is that it doesn't have to be, um, you know, shouldn't, it shouldn't be a portrait and it doesn't have to be, uh, it can just be a silhouette and a silhouette is good enough to actually bring some life and energy into a sketch like this one. But obviously you can only put a silhouette into a landscape if your landscape is backlit because it won't look right. If you were to paint right here, now here, for example, right. these can't be silhouettes. Um, this, uh, this skyscape I painted from um, my studio, I have a beautiful view of the ocean out there, and I paint the sky, the sky is beautiful. So I painted it, so there's nothing at the bottom of it, it was just a, a sky, and I just put it aside, I didn't look at it. And uh, then I found it and thought, oh, I love this sky, but I, it doesn't make a painting on its own, it's got to have something. So then I went out onto the beach and found figures that worked for it. So they can't be silhouette because that sky wouldn't have silhouettes in front of it because if you can see the light is from the right hand side and on top because we can see from the clouds the volume of the clouds so you couldn't put silhouettes onto that because it wouldn't make sense because it isn't backlit right. so I, when I went down to the beach I had to choose the same time of day as this was painted and then just find some figures who I thought uh, matched if you look at the next slide it's the figures are in in, in um, more detail I've just done it closer up there we go oh yeah so, now here you can see, now if you look very closely, you can see I have pencil marked them in first because I was putting them onto a sky wash that I really liked and I didn't want to mess it up. I did pencil wash, but again, not outlines. I just did a tiny indication just for scale and just for their position in relation to each other because the gap between them matters as much as their shapes. So the flow, you know, I was trying to find a nice sort of um, movement and it was... Uh, uh, quite a while before you know there were quite a lot of people walking on the beach and there was lots of different things so it was I did the sketches on something else before I chose who I was going to do to find out what I wanted to do in this bottom corner right. and the hat is uh, is white paint on top so that it's lighter than okay. the cool than the background it's so beautiful you know I, I'm I'm learning from you and I and I already knew this but you know you just have to keep getting, you know, hearing the message again and again to get in that, that, that art isn't about um, perfection and making this perfect reproduction of something that you see like a photo. In fact, there's some beauty and charm in imperfections. And you know, when you draw the perfect outline and pencil, and then you pick, fill it in like a coloring book. Well, it's kind of. Well, it'll be static. The problem is what you're trying to do is you're trying to create life. You know, a painting that works is one that has a life of its own. It becomes something of its own it's not you know it's not a copy of the world it's a new creation and right. that's the important thing um uh, now here this one and i think uh, uh was the, what's the next one i oh yes this one and then yes they're still talking about figures that are dark in the background here um the figures are painted first no background at all they are in a street uh, this in the street but the street i'm not even looking at because I'm not going to see this again, probably the boy pushing his brother, or presumed brother, in the wheelbarrow. So I have to get in quickly, 
paint the figures <coughs> beforehand. So I haven't even thought about the background. Figures are gone, the figures are there, the, the, the real people have gone out, out and gone down, there's lots of other children playing. Now I have to introduce a background. So if you've got figures you've painted and you want to create a background around them, then you need to make sure you don't conflict. So the background behind the dark of the boy has to be lighter or much dark. So you see where he's lit on the left hand side, I've put a figure behind him to bring out the light on him. Right. On his right hand side where he's dark, I've made sure that the house, part of the house behind him is light, even though it's the shady side of the house. So in other words, you can't, you've got to be aware that your picture matters far more than what's happening in the real world. Right. Now what I've done was I could have, I could have, um, you know, put the light part of a, a building behind him, but then I wouldn't have had the option, you know, then I'd have had only light behind him and he'd have looked haloed. So what I decided to do was just basically compose it as I did, and, I, and the reason I chose it is because I like the composition. Uh, you know, there's plenty of times I've done it and I don't like the composition. <laughs> um, so once you've got your figures, if you're now adding your setting, you must make sure it complements the light and dark tones of your figure. Right. So you're the really next, taking advantage of the light dark contrast here. Yeah. yeah. So here we have here, I painted the silhouettes. This is a London street, it's Regent Street. I paint a lot of figures on Regent Street. And I painted that the, the figures I've painted in silhouette. So there's nothing else on the paper to start with, just silhouette figures, uh, one after the other painted, as I say, you know, they're all going to be a different time frame no and no time are they all in this position um, and the shadows so on the paper would be the figures and the shadows and then I have brought down the background behind them leaving the halos of light because I love painting into the light I love halos mm -hmm. so I haven't in this instance painted the background first and put them on top this time the silhouettes are painted first then the background is added and the foreground uh, is light to contrast. So we've got our three major tones, dark, light, and mid-tone. Any painting really so, needs dark and mid-tone. So gorgeous and so attractive. Um, and, and Hazel, I'm thinking, you know, your, your love and uh, preference for that halo really adds a lot to your art. I mean, it's a, that's such a wonderful um, little trick there that I'm sure all, everybody's writing it down right now. <laughs> Halo, <laughs> um, but but really, it just adds so much to the to the whole composition, and it just adds like a, a sparkle. Just so gorgeous. So I mean, it's one of my favorite favorite views. I just love when the sun goes down. But I think one is almost luckier in low latitude countries in London because you have, um, and you're in Canada, so you've got it too. Um, you have a lower sun at a time when you're still people are out and about doing things. And so you get this lovely effect, especially if you've got cities, because then you've got dark things against them. Um, and I just, I just love that. Hey, I, I love that sparkle of light against dark. It's really, I mean, it really, it's just tone. It's just dark light and mid tone, isn't it? And that's what makes a painting. Yeah. I mean, really, this is, um, you know, it looks so simple. There's just very few elements and very few colors in here. But there's so much sparkle, so much energy, so much light, and it's so attractive with that light dark contrast. It's, it's just gorgeous, really. Less is more, less is more. more. Okay. Uh, then this is just a quickie to say, uh, basically, if you're going to paint, uh, if you're going to do a setting on this, you want to include people, and you want to do, um, not be adding them, but you want it to be about the people, the children, for example, they move very quickly. So basically, in this case, I have drawn uh, quickly their shapes and the composition so that I know where I want them to be. They're still there. They're still sitting there when I paint them. But basically, you've got to start with the figures because they are going to move. So everything else is going to stay static. So you mustn't think, oh, I'll just get the back because the children will go. The, the one thing that's absolutely guaranteed is if you don't paint the focus of your painting right at the start, it will have gone by the time you paint it. So yeah. it's very important you go straight and you don't faff around at the sides thinking, well, I'll be brave about the figures when I've done the hut, or if I do the trees first, I'll feel better and, and the paint for it. You just go straight in with the main event because if it doesn't work, then you know not to waste time. Yeah, and by uh, then the children will have left anyway if you wait. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. And you know, that's I mean, something that I actually noticed in your book as well. Um, as, and you can see here, not a lot of faces. 
um, it, when you've got a figure just in the background. Yes, you've done some portraits, there's some beautiful portraits, and you are a, a wonderful portrait artist, um, but when you're putting figures in, uh, I see, I, I don't see it very many faces, face details at all, and I realize it's not important, it doesn't matter. That's just like really uh, focusing on too small of a detail. Yeah, basically, I mean, certainly if they're in shadow, you don't see the faces anyway. Um, but really, it's just light and dark. Um, the, have we gone back to one now? Have we gone, oh, this is next. Oh, no, no, this is next. Oh, yes, no, this is what I want to come to next. Yes, leaving light. Good, good, good. Right. So if people are lit, if they're not silhouetted, they're not backlit, uh, they might be side lit or they might be top lit. And this is when you start to have to leave out white paper in watercolour. So now it does get more challenging. So this is where I would say to start with, if you're a bit nervous, by all means, use a pencil. But again, don't follow your lines. Here, there's no pencil here because I'm you know, used to doing it. But basically, if you look, the uh, figure has been painted limbs first, so that's normal. And then I've gone the turquoise, which I've painted the shadow on the hat, the shirt and the trousers. And then color has been dropped into the trousers to change them into khaki. And then another blue used to come around the shape to differentiate the, uh, the or to uh, make the hat appear and the shoulder appear. And that same blue is used for the bag. Again, very quick sketch. Um, the man actually, he was sort of standing quite still, sort of holding his cell phone, as you can see in the pose. Yeah. Um, but um, long enough for me to get the shape. But the beauty of, um, I think, the, People holding cell phones tend to move slower. They're really useful. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, go, go for the cell phone holders. <laughs> you know what? I, I noticed that that's really true when I was uh, teaching a figure drawing class. Um, that when you look at a crowd of people, more than half the people are, look, are standing in this position, looking down with their two hands, or at least one hand, in front of their face holding a cell phone. They're all in that static position. So that really helps a lot if you want to add figures. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing. It's really helpful. <laughs> well, that's funny. And now this woman, again, this is another, the same kind of thing, the lozenges of light. So here the uh, light on both shoulders has to be brought by the background because you can't create the light without having the background. You can tell she's holding a baby just by the pose there. Very, um, my, you know, hardly anything, just the, the hand and the head showing it. And then just that lozenge of light on her, as her knee comes forward. Uh, and then the shadow down the side of her skirt that tells you. So it's very little. Uh, I'm telling you very little, but you know, you can tell that her knee comes forward, her feet here straight on because they're straight onto us, so no feet. Um, her shirt is lit, so there's a crisp edge between that and the green sarong below because it, the top of it's lit. Uh, I mean, how little, you know, it's done in seconds and again, but it tells you so much. I mean, we yeah. kind of know what she's up to. We know what she's doing. We, we almost know, you know, it's amazing. I just find it amazing what watercolour can do. <laughs> so cool. Oh, my goodness. Hey. Right, now you were talking about halos earlier. Now, here, the, uh, this is St. Mark's Square. And the, uh, now it's you know, quite difficult to paint there because they keep moving you on all the time. So you've got to paint very quickly there. Oh, yeah. But if you uh, sit on the steps right at the back so that St. Mark's is, uh, you've got a lovely long view right across the piazza. And needless to say, not now probably with coronavirus, but crowds and crowds. So here, the background is painted first. And I have just left a very raggedy edge of white uh, indentation. So I don't know where the figures are going to go, but I have left myself lots of white space for heads to go into because I know I can fill the spaces, but I just need to make sure I have got some white space. Because if I paint the colour right down to the horizon line, then I haven't got my halos. So if you imagine that, that the beginning of this painting was just the backdrop with lots of, with a sort of a funny bottom to it. Yeah. <laughs> if you if you go to the next one, I think it shows it closer so you can see more closely uh, the raggedy edge. Right there, you can see the raggedy edge. And now there are the figures. So then the figures are now, now I've got my backdrop in, and now I just pick figures or groups. Uh, here you can see I picked a pair together. Um, and then the, the ones in the background, look how loosely they're painted. I mean, these are literally just marks. Look, but yeah. the thing that makes it work is that all the light is consistently from one side. So I'm well aware where my light is. I'm well aware to leave white 
on their left hand sides, isn't it? Yes, on our yeah. right, on their left hand sides. Um, and so if you go back to the main picture again, if you go back to the, the, the um, one before, uh, they all work consistently together. Some of them, um, hard, I mean, hardly barely exist. Yeah. They create a whole crowd and they're just marks. So I, I did those two, the two main figures, the in pink and black shirt, they're done first. So I've got an anchor because you do need to have something that makes someone know that, you know, these are figures and they're not just marks. As soon as you've got an anchor, any repetition, our mind just immediately assumes they're figures. So you need very little. So if we go back to the other close up one again, if you go, uh, go on to the one, yeah, that's it. Just now, just look between, you know, they're just marks. And yet you think they're people. Yeah. They're not. They're not. That's yeah. the beauty. I love that art is suggesting. It's all it is, yeah. isn't it? It's fabulous. It's, it's so gorgeous. So you've just got, you know, you really focused on um, the, the first, the, the, maybe these four uh, bigger figures. And then everything behind is just little dot, dabs of color. And that's it. And making sure that I leave the halo on the left side, I mean, on the right, in the painting, on the right side. So making sure that I consistently leave the halos on the lit side, because then it will hold together. Cool, that's beautiful, so beautiful. Oh, did we see him already? Uh, no, 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 this, this is just because I paid so many billions of elements. I'm now just, just going to talk about lozenges of light on the animals, but we'll flick through them quicker because I think the people is more useful. But just this one and the next one, you just see these little lozenges of light that are left. So here it's the back of the elephant, the top of the head. The next one, it's the, um, if you flick on the next one, it's the backs on the spring box sitting on the, on the, um, in, in the veld. Um, and then the last one, uh, a spring box with its bottom, it's just these, this white shape, but here's a more specific white shape left out, but leaving the white out uh, um, is amazingly lively in a watercolour. It, it's uh, because it's a, a, it uses the tone of the paper, but is surrounded by colour. It's an incredibly powerful tool in watercolour. So uh, I would say it's great to do silhouettes, and I love doing silhouettes, but don't shy away from using things with light because it's this... Um, it's the leaving light out of a watercolour that, in a way, tells people you know what you're doing. If you yeah. look at the next one along, the next one is, is figures again, and you'll see that the, um, the figures are literally, all it is, is white left out of the wash for the shadow on this building. And he's, that guy, his uh, limbs and face tell you he's a figure. Now look under the table, it's just splodgy, splodgy, run legs and, and shorts, you know, you can't, but just by leaving that little lozenge shape of white out as a hunched shoulder. Yeah. All the yeah. I mean, it just, uh, you know, and if you didn't have them in there, it's not as interesting a painting. Put your thumb over them and hide them. Yeah. Um, and likewise, this one here. Now, these were brought in for scale. You asked at the beginning, why bring figures into paintings? And one of the reasons is in a landscape is scale. If you don't have the figures here, we don't know how high this waterfall is. Mm -hmm. And this is Noel Kwame Falls. Um, but because the figures are there, so the figures, so here I did draw them in with pencil um, because I was trying to make sure, I know that knew again they were going to move. In fact, they sat still for ages. They were marvellous mm -hmm. models. Um, but by... Uh, they are there for scale and that's one of the important uses of figures in painting is to use them for scale. Yeah I just want to mention uh, Eileen uh, Goldenberg says she's been painting along as we're talking now I suppose and she says I can truly see how many hours you've spent practicing these figures and animals and I'm inspired thank you. Oh good 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 good. Right, now this painting was painted again in Tunisia and I was uh, sitting on a, a road island in the middle of a very busy traffic area and because it's obviously quite complex, they, it, it, I have used pencil to uh, hold back the light paper for the uh, light figures. Now here, the pencil is used as a guide for the brush, so I am obeying my pencil lines a little bit more than I would if they were just um, sort of free flowing against a, a light background because the edge, the, the pencil drawing has to tell me where I must stop, for example, the wall behind them or um, which is always the wall, I think, in, in this case, yes. So uh, 
before I started painting, I had done, um, I had uh, drawn in those shapes of these figures. And obviously they're quite, they're not difficult shapes because they're all in robes. Um, to just basically tell my brush, to give me the confidence to know wh where my brush can and cannot go. Yeah. Um, and so there is definitely a time if you're trying to preserve light in watercolour, use that pencil um, because otherwise it'd be very difficult to know where to, you know, when, where not to paint. And you've got to be able to paint freely. You, can't, you know, if you get too fussy and edgy, you lose the expression. And any figure that was darker than the background, I didn't even have to, I didn't have to draw. So the figures under the umbrella who are dark against the light background, I didn't worry about them because I know I can add them on afterwards. And, you know, people are coming and going to a market, so you know you're going to have a, a mark, you know, you're going to have your subject. So it's only the light figures that I had to make sure I knew where they were going to be. Right. Cool. So beautiful. My gosh. And now, now here is basically, if you don't preserve the light, this is about white paint. Now, not the ones on the right, they are white paper um, preserved. But the guys on the left, if you, I, I, you can't really go in close, I didn't do a close up of this, but the okay. white, the shirt, the, the second one in, oh, you can. Oh, brilliant. A little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. You might just be able to see uh, the highlights on their shoulders are white paper, but the highlight down the arm and the white sh the shirt in shadow, that's white paint because I had already painted in the background. I'd left myself little. Um, I'm sitting on a, a sort of a uh, what do I, I don't know what you call it. It's on a, it's on a promenade anyway in in, in uh, Porto Venere, and. Uh, so I know my head heights of everybody and I know I want to have a whole bunch of people. It's easy to do my people on the right hand side because they're coming and going, but I want to get my background in. So I just left out uh, at the same height as the people on the right, some space in the background for their shoulders and heads. Right. But I didn't leave it out for the bodies because I didn't really know, you know, I thought, well, I'll paint them dark. But then when I started to paint, I realized I needed them to be lighter one of them at least, lighter than the background for it to balance. And so I've used white paint over the background so that he looks lighter. So, you know, white paint um, is, and here another one, the umbrellas are what you can see more clearly, probably the umbrella on the right is white paint painted over the background. So the whole background was painted in first, figures are then painted in silhouette, but the brollies, which are catching the light, are painted with white paint or red, um, Red, uh, cadmium red is a nice opaque colour as well, so that will paint on top of the lighter uh, yellow background. Right, okay, so let's move on. Um, now, um, this, this little section is just going to be about mixing colours because basically you can't have too many colours if you're going to try and paint quickly. So right. here uh, is an example. Here is just cadmium red and Prussian blue, just two colours. So you need to know your colours. You need to be familiar with your colours so you know what minimum colours you can mix together to get what you want out of them. Uh, now, in this instance, I want black, red and shadow colour on a white body. So I know that cadmium red and Prussian blue mix together to make a fine black. Mm -hmm. So I just paint the whole wing. Each one is painted individually, not painted together, one at a time, and then it's made as a composition across the sketchbook. So each one is painted you know, as different flamingos are flying off. Uh, so the wings are painted in first, just big red slashes with a big size 10 brush. And then the blue is added on top of the red and that's what turns it to black. Wow. And then the blue is then used to be the shadow of the body of the bird. Yep. And brought right round to under the neck. Then a tiny bit of red is dashed in under the uh, chin. And then the red legs are just slashed down. And it's, you have to do them so quick because they're moving so fast. You have to watch quite a bit of time and work out what they're doing. Uh, you don't have to put the legs on to start with. So if you can't work out where the legs go, you can wait. Um, but it's really getting those wings to be, you know, a shape that works. So that's why they go in first. Um, and uh, I have painted countless flamingos as well. So I have a sort of, you know, I kind of know what's going to happen. But, um, you know, as we know, it can all go wrong as well but there's so just two inspiring. really i'm so inspired i'm just looking at this thinking oh, i would like to spend a whole day painting flamingos now i never really thought about it but now i really want to paint flamingos with two colors which is really incredible it's thrilling and it, it's so possible as soon as you make minimums um it, it's just so possible mm -hmm. 
Oh. And now here, here, each again, this each bird only has I think three colours, um, but. I wanted a page full of, this is in the Kalahari again, sitting by a sort of a place where the water was coming down. So the birds were coming down to the water. So I had plenty of subject matter. Um, and so it's a colorful page, but each bird is painted individually. And, so, and each bird has only got three colors. So um, the two at the top have a yellow base and then black run into them and a bit of um, yellow ochre or red at the top one and so on and so on through the birds. Um, but Again, it's this minimum, three colours max is, uh, you know, really, it's different with people because they wear colourful clothes, so you can always add a colour in and that works fine. But with animals, certainly, three colours is usually all you ever need. Yeah, that's a beautiful page. I love that. So <laughs> I love the, these sketchbooks. I must admit, this, um, these Cardi sketchbooks, I really highly recommend them. They're lovely. They've got big hardbacks. And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're robust. Uh, the only thing is when you're working in a vehicle, they, they sort of go right across the steering wheel. So you've got yeah. to be able to have a bit of room. But they're so robust um, that, and they give you a lovely big space to work. Could you so, the brand? Uh, he probably didn't hear it. K-H-A-D-I. It might be spelled on the back of one of these. Yes, there we go. Okay, so I guess... Um you know, we're, people are calling in from all over the world. And so if you're interested in that sketchbook, it's K-H-A-D-I, and you should really uh, just look it up online, see what you can find. They're made in India, um, and the painter is, uh, it's all very um, uh, ecological in that it's that they're old sort of white t-shirts that have been um, recycled. Oh. And, and uh, so it's long fiber cotton, so it stays wet longer. I mean, this is one of the things that I, reason I love them is they, because the paper is um, long fibered, it stays wet longer than um, a normal paper. Cool. Right, now this is just yellow ochre and violet. Yellow ochre and violet together make a lovely brownie gray. Yeah. So just two colors. So again, it's fine, you know, there, it's gonna be opposite colors, isn't it? So with Prussian blue and red, it's red and a, a, you know a turquoisey color here it's violet and yellow so your your opposites are you know are, um, orange and blue are a good combination or brown and blue are a good combination so those two color combinations are nearly always going to be opposite colors but i mean you don't have to you know things don't have to be realistically colored they can be any colors really so then the next one is three colors again next one here now that again is my yellow ochre Lizarin crimson Prussian blue combination, which I absolutely love. And it looks like so many more colors, doesn't it? It looks like so many more colors than just those three. Yeah. Because each one, when you work with minimum colors, what you're doing is you're making the interaction between color more powerful. If you have too many colors, you deny each individual color its power. So the reason that watercolor is meant to be done with a limited, this is where it's different to oils because in the transparent medium, you want a minimum number of colors because then they will each make the other color more colorful as they right. interact with each other. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I've gained a new appreciation for um, charging in with other colors and just allowing those colors to mix on the paper rather than have a solid color here and another solid color there. Another. It's kind of boring. It's, it's much, much more interesting to see how those colors are playing with each other. Well, you only need red, yellow, and blue. You can get all the colours of red, yellow, and blue. So basically, you know, you make you you, you find combinations of red, yellow, and blue. There's, and there's so many different combinations that basically you, you're never going to, in a lifetime, be able to get through them all. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Wow. Here's another company. Now here's red, yellow, and blue, and this is three opaque watercolour colours. So this is cadmium yellow, cadmium red, or scarlet lake. I'm not. I can't be sure. It is. It might be scarlet lake, but I. I, I think it might be Scarlet Lake actually, and then Ultramarine, no, it's Cobalt Blue. Yes, it's, uh, so it's Cadmium Yellow, Scarlet Lake, and Cobalt Blue. And makes another lovely combination. So it's just this, you know, red, yellow, and blue. Ah, ah I'll tell you what I did remember to say, or didn't, nearly forgot to say. On my website, under, which is hazelsone.com, um, or allsoneup.com, um, there is a, a drop down menu at the top called Paint with the Artist. If you go to that and click Paint with the Artist, in the drop down menu, it's got YouTube clips. If you click on that, there is a two minute uh, painting, a speed Ellie painting 
of this, these, using these three colors. So if you want to see how these are made, and want to see how the first of the outline is done. So I, as I'm not doing a demo on this um, talk, um, you can see very clearly on that, on the, on the website. This guy is so cute. And you know, like it's like a, a whole sunrise is happening right on his back. Well, I, I mean, that's, you get the reds of Africa, which is so special. And here, uh, basically, is putting it, you know, a whole bunch of them together and showing that um, you know, just within, again, this three colour scheme. And this is my yellow ochre, uh, alizarin and Prussian blue combination, again, which I find I use a lot. Um, how, you know, one can be redder, one can be bluer, one can be yellower. So even within a set of elephants, you don't have to make them all the same colour. They can all feel different. And they'll, and they'll all work together in harmony because they're only three colors. And so you're guaranteed harmony. So you can afford to make, you know, push one in the warm direction and push one in a cool direction. So it's, it's a sort of a fail safe as well. You know, using limited color is actually a greater freedom. It's not a limitation at all, if anything. It's yeah. giving you freedom. That's beautiful. And I love um, this sort of uh, the cloud of dots right in the middle at their feet. You know, really, you can just... <laughs> So your watercolor spread, that's okay. It, it looks like you're running through a cloud of dust. Beautiful. And this is the beauty of all, and, and, and I mean, to be honest, you know, if you don't know where to put the feet and you're, you're painting something in a, in a dusty, uh, dusty circumstance, use the dust because you don't, you know, the dust is more as beautiful. You're making a painting. You're not trying to tell the world somebody has feet or elephants have four legs. You're trying to say, look how beautiful this is. Yeah. Uh, lovely. And here's the three colours in a, in a figure situation. This is New York. Uh, and so here we have Aureo, uh, no, we have the same column combination. It's, um, uh, no, it's not, it's Aureolin this time. Aureolin, Elizabeth Crimson and Ultramarine Blue. And again, so the yellow goes in first, then the pink, then the blue, and then the three colours mixed together to make the darker colours of the figures and the vehicles. And the beauty with doing it like this is that, as I mentioned before, if you haven't got a lot of water, you don't want to carry too much water, your water gets dirty in the right order. So instead of uh, here, we, you know, there's always going to be plenty of people. So it doesn't matter which figures I'm going to paint. I don't have to paint them first. I've left out the halos from the background because I know I want to put figures in. So basically the figures kind of walk into the painting. So the figures, you know, I'm just going to pick any figures that are coming um, when I get to the figure point, because that's when I'm using the dark color and when the water, uh, when the water itself gets muddy and then it's no good for doing the pale background colors yeah so it's just really management of your materials really well it's, it's so beautiful i love it's got so much sparkle and that's such a great tip i think that's my favorite tip from our talk today oh now, the, these next three paintings are huge so these are not done um, from life they're done back in my studio but this is where i i so believe in the power of the sketch that i often make my big paintings look as if I have sketched them very suddenly. So I might spend a long, long, long time trying to make it look like I did it in five minutes, which sounds rather bizarre. Um, but I so believe that the immediacy of the sketch is what makes watercolor live. That if I'm like, these are big imperial size uh, painting, uh, even bigger, sorry, they're, um, you know, meter, meter wide paintings, um, that I, I deliberately paint the same way as I paint when I'm out on the street. So here I will lay, the, it will be indigo would be my undercolor, very pale. So the palest bit of indigo you can see, say on the right hand uh, guy, this is the OK Corral, this was done in Tombstone where they reenact the OK Corral. Um, and uh, so I painted the shapes, first of all, not the heads, not the hands, but the shapes with a very pale indigo, and then I have dropped the indigo in. So this is like the monk. This is the same process as the oh, monk. Okay. Shapes painted first, and here the feet obviously do matter because it's a lot bigger. So this is what we're saying about if it's going to go much bigger, you might need more detail. Yeah. Um, uh, and obviously, um, again, there is a bit of facial feature here, but the facial features are just dropped in to the wet wash so that they're not too pronounced. Now, they are actual... Um, um, you know, they could be actual people, they're not actual people, but I mean, they're meant to be white herb and whatever. Um, so there are faces, so because here we are now talking about figures that are, you know, this high. Um, and so, but, but this is painted back in the studio. I wouldn't want, I mean, I couldn't work that big, you know, I couldn't work outside that big um, very easily. Um, 
because obviously you'd have to, you know, without sitting at an easel or anything, you'd have to have it flat on the ground, which is not the easiest thing in the rain. <laughs> yes, I have a question for you from Yelena uh, Castell, and I'm sorry if I pronounced that wrong. She's saying, um, would Hinsel recommend learning more of animal and person anatomy for larger paintings, or would this generally be sufficient as long as you have the proportions right? Well, this is a difficult one because basically because I went to art college I did learn anatomy so I already and I, even before I went to art college I was reading and drawing from anatomy books um, so I would say yes I mean the more information you've got the more you know the more confident you can be so any knowledge is going to be useful um, I, it's difficult for me to say because obviously I had that if you know I, I, I if you've been to art college you are trained in that way and obviously yeah. that helps immensely but yes i would say yes um but at the same time i would say good observation good observation will you know the information is out there if you look so if you're really good at observation you will learn anatomy by observation because mostly if you're painting people with clothing on you can't see the anatomy but you will learn which way a leg goes and which way an arm bends and which you know where the pressure you know where the weight lies or what. so um, that that's a very, that's a very good question that is <laughs> it practice it's as well as study yeah 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 I mean you do I think to be a good watercolorist you do need to be able to draw but at the same time you can make watercolors and not be able to draw so. Uh, There's no final answer. People have to do what, what is right for them. Yes, and people find the thing that appeals to them. You know, if you like drawing people, the chances are you are going to look into anatomy yeah. because you like drawing people. So here, I mean, these, uh, these figures, my pleasure with these figures was again to do it large, making it feel like a sketch on the hoof, and it's done large and in the studio. Mm -hmm. um, but it was the actual grouping. I loved the link. I loved the way the boys are linked together. You know, the whole idea was I wanted to get that camaraderie sort of thing that I, I, I really love that. Again, here, limited palette like the other one, but just touching in things like the red. So basically, engineer whatever you need to make, you know, the world out there doesn't necessarily offer you what you need for a painting. But as a painter, you get to know what you need. So if you've got predominantly muted colours, thankfully people, unlike animals, might suddenly have a red shirt on. Now he may not have had a red shirt on, and I don't believe he had a red shirt on. I can't actually remember now in the, in the, you know, in the history of all my sketches. But I know that that's going to help those greens and blues come out. So don't, you know, use, your, use, use what you know. You know, we, there are rules in painting, and if you you can obey them and you can break them at will, but you know, don't, it's this not, you know, the beauty of painting from life is that you get to copy the world, but not copy it because it moves quickly. And so yeah. you make, uh, you make um, generalizations, which are good. But then if you're going to make it, if you're going to make things into paintings, it may not always, they won't offer you necessarily what is, picturesque or what is exactly what you need you have to think i need some red in here which is one of the reasons you might add a figure into a painting i need a contrast i need to make this painting come alive i need contrast yeah and that's, that's really good advice oh um, this is just one of my i love looking at figures from above and i go whenever i go to venice i go up the campanile and i just perch myself in a little corner and spend age and thankfully again before covid there was plenty of people around um but this is just it's just one of my favorite and again i'm it, it's a big painting and i'm trying to make it feel like it's just a small quick sketch so i'm it, they're they're done in exactly the same way that I paint figures when I'm doing them on in the, on the small scale or not making a painting. They're done with the um, light red first of all, and then the clothing washed in and allowed to blend. So it's exactly the same story, but much bigger. So cool! I, I love this painting. I, I love painting looking down as well. I just I don't know if you've got the light and shade book there, but it's on the front. It's on the front cover, isn't it, of the light and shade book? Yeah, uh, I I couldn't find my copy of the book for today's interview, but I have that book and I love that book. It's beautiful. And I love this painting. So yeah, I like yeah. So so that's another one, and that's got a lot of uh, things about painting people in it as well. Yeah. This last this is, this is the last picture because 
this this was a, a teeny weeny small sketch of an elephant you know about i don't know three inches high and it was seen by the high commissioner of the eu commission in Windhoek, and they said oh wow we would like to have that made huge and on our wall in the high commission in the embassy in Windhoek. and to me that's exactly what this sketching is about is that this how amazing that a thing three inches high, a teeny weeny bit of watercolour, just Prussian blue and the cadmium red, same colours as the flamingos, ends up being blown up. So it's the sketch blown up. So this is, um, you know, they did this as a print. So this is the sketch blown up to that size. And it still has life and power. You can see, I mean, it's not the most perfect photo, but you can see the raggedy edge of the watercolour. You can see where it's bled. To me, this is exactly why I just I can't help but encourage you to have the boldness just to go in straight with the paint because you get this kind of magic and you you couldn't engineer it I can't make it bleed in all those same places I can't make it do it it does it I just have to offer it the paper and make it happen well I think um, you you do add an awful lot of skill to the <laughs> to the well, process so is this our last sketch Sorry, that's the last sketch, yeah, that's the last sketch. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much for chatting with us today and showing us your gorgeous sketches and I, your enthusiasm is so infectious. I'm sure that people are just gonna go straight out and pull out their watercolor paints right now. Um, you're so beautiful yourself and your paints are also so beautiful. It's just been really great to chat with you. And so I just wanna thank you. Thank you everybody for chatting with us today and coming in and, and listening to our, our chat. Um, I want to let you know that we have uh, interviews coming up on September 15th. Vincent de Planche uh, from France is going to be um, talking to us about sketching mountains and landscapes. Vincent is an urban sketcher, an artist, a freelance illustrator, uh, and he has uh, done a lot of illustrating for um, children's nonfiction books, and he's an expert on mountains and landscapes. And so he's going to be um, chatting with us on September 15th. And then on September 28th, I'm going to be talking to Felix Scheinberger. And Felix uh, uh, is going to be talking about Dare to Sketch People. Felix is an illustrator and an artist, and he's a designer based in Berlin. He's the author and illustrator of urban, uh, urban watercolor sketching, as well as several books in German on watercolors. And he's illustrated more than 50 children's books in the last decade. So that's uh, Felix Scheinberger on September 28th. Let me bring back Hazel. There she is. All right. Hazel, okay, so thank you so much. Um, do you have any last words that you'd like to share with anyone? Yes, I do actually, because I think this, these are difficult times. I mean, this is sort of unprecedented in our lifetime to not have, not be able to go out and paint and not to have so many people around to paint. So I think, you know, you, you must keep painting. Whatever happens, even if you're painting from memory or in the house or whatever, you must be letting your brush dance across the paper. It is keeping that brush going keeping it keeping it dancing really use it to use the time to experiment with new ideas but don't worry about trying to make paintings just paint just get out paint. there just, just get out it. there yeah, yeah. yeah if you can't get out there do it inside but i mean there's you know there's a cat or a dog or you know anything just be just to keep the brush moving you just mustn't not be painting basically because it's a bit like exercise if you get out of the habit then you lose your confidence mm -hmm. and you'll start to get back into it again. But, uh, and I've also got a very favorite quote, which I love, which I'm going to pass on because it's an Oscar Wilde quote, which is, uh, it's kept, I, I really love this quote because to me, it's what it's all about. Art begins where imitation ends. Hmm. You don't copy what you yeah. see. Interpret. Exactly. That's wonderful. I'm going to read you a couple of comments. Um, Yelena Castell says, Hazel inspires me every day. She's given, oh. push. She's given me the push I needed for my watercolor time and time again, and I want to thank her. And uh, also, um, Phoebe Wilson says, thank you, thank you so much. It's such a gift. Um, and uh, also, um, Cynthia says, um, um, she has she says, yes, I've had your books out, but um, still felt overwhelmed. It's just so wonderful to hear you talk in person. She can't wait to try. So that's so nice. Thank you, you guys, for coming to our, our chat. And we'll see you next time. And thank you so much. Cecil. It's been a pleasure. Okay.
Bye, everyone. Take care. <laughs> Bye. Hey, everyone. I hope you were inspired by this interview and learned a lot. I know I did. If you enjoyed this interview, please subscribe to our YouTube channel by clicking on the red subscribe button in the bottom right corner of your screen. Thanks so much. Take care.